The Dakota War was over. Dozens of warriors were executed in Mankato, and hundreds of Dakota died in the concentration camp under Fort Snelling. Little Crow, Minnesota's equivalent of Osama bin Laden of that time period, had not been seen in months. The winter had come and gone. Where did he go? Spring is just arriving in 2017 as well. It's literally the first weekend to go out riding. I go to a local biker coffee shop and get myself some breakfast. It's also a location that I edit videos sometimes too. My first stop is the Minnehaha Falls in Minneapolis. One unknown treasure of this park is there is an unmarked sculpture dedicated to Little Crow. As a child, I remember seeing this mask, and it's been there for decades. There's no kiosk explaining who it is, why it's there, or what they were known for. This unmarked mask overlooking the falls is indeed Little Crow. This isn't the only effigy dedicated to the Dakota chief. It was a warm enough afternoon, so I went out to central Minnesota to find out where the Dakota chief's story came to an end. On this day in history, General Lee of the Confederacy ordered an infantry assault on the Union forces at Gettysburg. Known as Pickett's Charge, this was the farthest north the Confederacy ever got and the last push they had to defeat the Union soldiers. This charge marked the turning point in the war and the inevitable demise of the Confederacy on July 3rd, 1863. That exact same date, Little Crow had returned back to Minnesota to his old lands, his, his homestead, basically, as much as you can call it that, and was stealing horses to get by. Well, it doesn't look like much, but uh, this is where Little Crow met his demise. Chief Little Crow, leader of the Sioux Indian outbreak in 1862, was shot and killed about 330 feet south of this point by Nathan Lamson and his son Chauncey on July 3rd, 1863. Uh, Little Crow, after, he, after the Dakota War, Little Crow had actually taken several hostages, one of them by the name of George Washington Ingalls, which is the cousin of Laura Ingalls Wilder, author of Little House on the Prairie. He ended up taking him and two other boys hostage with several other Dakota and went all the way up to the U.S.-Canada border, pretty much in exile. As the months went by over the winter, they ended up ransoming off the three kids for horses and blankets. But what happened here is Little Crow was actually back here picking berries with his son. Uh, it, it really doesn't look like much, and it's, it's hard for me to uh, speculate what this region would have looked like you know, 155 years ago. They were out picking berries with his son when the Lamsons, Nathan and Chauncey, both came out and found uh, the two Dakota. And because of the scalping ransoms, there's about, I think it was $25 a scalp, which is this much in today's money. Quite a bit of money to shoot, kill, and scalp. They ended up getting into a firefight, and I believe Nathan was shot, and Chauncey ended up shooting Little Crow and killing him. He was shot twice, and then his son ran away. Uh, he ended up being found miles away almost a month later on July 28th. So 20, July 3rd is when this happened. They found him on July 28th all the way in Devil's Lake, which is in eastern North Dakota, which was then the Dakota Territory. So he actually made it pretty far. I ended up speaking with one of the locals. It's north of Hutchinson. I want to say a good maybe five minute ride. And when they were paving this road, they almost got rid of this marker. And uh, the uh, local over here, probably maybe the old homestead of the Lambsons that's over there, uh, was uh, very against it and ended up speaking with the foreman or the leaders of the project to save this stone. Native Americans apparently stop by here and walk all the way to Hutchinson. So this is the end of the line. This is where it all ended. This is really, uh, this is it. I drove all the way out here just to make sure that I could be in the spot where it ended. It's worth it, I think. It really brings closure to the adventure that was the, the 1862 Dakota War. This is it.
I am here with Little Crow, an actual statue that they uh, put up to commemorate the Dakota chief. So at first the people of Hutchinson weren't exactly certain that it was Little Crow. They knew that there was a Dakota man that opened fire on two white settlers, so the Lambsons. So the next day they went out to try to find the body of him and they found him and he was actually wearing the coat of a settler that was murdered two days prior. So knowing that he was a more militant native known for, for killing a white man, they desecrated his body to the absolute worst degree. They dragged him down Main Street with firecrackers up his nose and then tossed his body into a refuse pit at a, at a slaughterhouse and beheaded him. They didn't really know exactly who they were dealing with, but then they held on to the body just in case. His son, Little Crow's son, ended up being found. He was actually brought back and uh, had and identified the body of his father by looking at his deformed wrists. Apparently was a, uh, an identifying marker. So that's how they knew that they had the body of Little Crow. Uh, his body parts, bones, skin, his remnants really weren't buried in, in their entirety all together at once. It ended up taking more than a century to get every identified piece of Little Crow back together again so, it, so he could be buried. This really marks the end. Uh, Little Crow ended up meeting his demise here in Hutchinson, Minnesota. He didn't really know any other life than the life that he lived in in Minnesota. He refused to leave. He refused to live a life in the Dakota Territory, in the Plains. He knew this was home. I guess I should really tell you what season two of Two Wheels, One Compass really ended up being about for me. Uh, the initial idea was to just go into, uh, into the Great Plains out in Minnesota eat buffalo and Minnesotan wild rice, uh, sleep in a teepee, and visit a holy site. That's really all I wanted to do, is make it a little fun project. But after stopping in New Ulm and seeing the historic locations of, of the battles and everything on the way there, I decided to make an entire season on the conflict. Initially, it was supposed to be about the war, but as I dug into the history of the locations that I'd gone, it ended up getting kind of dark. It begins with the atrocities that led to the demise of the Dakota in Minnesota. It, it was a treaty that ended up being broken, the annuity payments were late, and it ended up resulting in a war, and now we have this, this statue. I found that some of the worst things that have ever happened in human history had been done because they were legal. The deposition of the politicians in New Ulm for speaking out against the draft in World War I exactly 100 years ago. This is being filmed in 2017. That happened in 1917. Everything that had happened then was completely legal. The Minnesota Commission of Public Safety monitoring citizens, taking away their right to privacy, as well as taking them out of any political positions that they had. It was all legal. They had every right to speak out against the draft. They had their rights completely taken away. The uh, atrocities that were done against the Native Americans in the region was legal. This season of Two Wheels, One Compass started off as a storytelling project that turned into a historical lesson. After looking into the similar dark parts of American history, I began to find a pattern. Executive Order 9066 on February 19th, 1942. 120,000 Japanese Americans were put into internment camps because of World War II. That executive order was legal. Uh, the, and you could, you could take it a step further and go to the human rights abuses and the genocide during the Holocaust and World War II. Again, all of it was legal. One major element that I hope that people take away from this season, you shouldn't base your morals on laws. For example, the, the deaths of hundreds of thousands and the billions of dollars wasted on the drug war against drugs such as marijuana, but the worst thing about it is being caught with it. I mean, it's really not that bad. It's not. It, in fact, it's much safer and there's no overdose. Uh, we all know this. However, making pot illegal has changed people's idea of what morality is. The people that smoke pot are immoral, even though what they're doing is healthier and safer than, than alcohol or cigarettes, which are legal. You have all of these laws that desecrated the, the thousands of lives of either the Dakota, the Jews in the Holocaust, the Japanese of the United States, the Germans of New Ulm in World War I. Some of the worst things that human beings have ever done were because they were legal. <laughs>